it's not about us asserting ourselves. It's not about us fixing the world. <laughs> it's about us, as you said earlier, learning to get back in tune so that we can feel the heartbeat of the universe again. Giles Hutchins is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Giles Hutchins is an executive coach and senior advisor at the forefront of the revolution in organizational and leadership consciousness and developmental approaches that enhance personal, organizational, and systemic agility and vitality. He is author and co-author of several leadership and organizational development papers and the books, The Nature of Business in 2012, The Illusion of Separation 2014, Future Fit, which I happen to have right here in, in front of me, Future Fits right there, Leading by Nature, which I have right here as well, 2022, just came out hot off the presses. And also this wonderful book, Regenerative Leadership. He is the chair of the Future Fit Leadership Academy and founder of Leadership Immersion, co-founder of Biomimicry for Creative Innovation and Regenerators. He runs an international leadership center at Springwood Farm, an area outside of the outstanding nature beauty near London, UK, a nice spot. I've seen some videos of it. I haven't been there personally, but I hope to convince him to, to get an invite very soon. Previously held corporate roles, head of transformation practice for KPMG, global director and head of sustainability for Atos, which has about 150,000 employees over 40 countries. He provides coaching at individual and organizational level, levels for those seeking to transform their personal and or work lives. He is also a keynote speaker on the future of business, regenerative leadership, and guest lectures at international business schools. His latest podcast series can be found uh, in the link of this podcast, and it is at thenatureofbusiness.org, where he also writes a blog and gives us plenty of wonderful information. Giles, welcome to the podcast. Real pleasure to be here with you today, Mark. It's an honor. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you so much. I really am glad that you found the time. I know you do a lot of different things and are all over. If I understand correctly, I want to start out slow and get a little bit more history on how you started out on this journey. And you've been doing this for over 10 years now, so a decade. Maybe exactly if you could tell us exactly how long and has there been an evolution in yourself that you've seen where you started out maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago, how that has evolved and changed and shifted over time or has after your studies and after you completed everything, was it always the way we're seeing it now in your books? Yeah, the, the journey started quite early on for me. I had an, a sort of quite a profound out-of-body experience when I was quite young, which stayed with me for many years. And then when I was a teenager, actually around the age of 15, a maths teacher actually showed us as a class films of animals being tested on alive in laboratories and animals being skinned alive in abattoirs and so forth. And that sent me down a rabbit hole. And, and so that led me to all sorts of explorations, which then by the age of 17 or 18, having flirted with activism and so forth, I made a promise to myself. And that promise to myself, that commitment was to go into business, to use the mind that I've been gifted with to understand why and how business was seen to be clashing with life on earth. I then went on a bit of a journey and that took me through finance, law, real estate, and then into management consultancy and helping all sorts of businesses around the world through various transformations. And in that, if you like, that sense of 
a bit like a journey of separation because I actually went into the belly of the beast and in the process started to lose my sense of deep connection with nature. Actually, global travel suits, business meetings, back to backs, 400 emails a day, you name it. In that process, I just kept a thread going and then made good on my promise. So when I made good on my promise was actually around 2005, 2006, with a David Attenborough program, who's, he spoke directly to me when he said, the time is now. If we don't do something, we are irreparably damaging the fabric of life on earth. And that was my calling that got me to stand up straight and make good on my promise. Otherwise, I was convincing myself to stay in business, to become a CEO. And then from that place in business, I would then be a force for good. But instead, I then pressed the eject button and first started in sustainable business. So I became global head of sustainability for a large multinational and learned a hell of a lot about sustainability and the ins and outs of it and making the business case for sustainability. But then I went further and this process was happening inside me. It was a metamorphic process when I look back on it at the time, it didn't always make sense of it. But the very clear message I was getting was this was about a sense of disconnection from nature. We had become disconnected from life itself. And we can explore later what we really mean by nature. It's not just trees and bushes and so forth. That deep sense of disconnection was creating the problems. And that we could go about sustainable business, for instance. But if we went about sustainable business without that sense of connectedness, then we were potentially creating further problems. And so I went deeper and left corporate life completely. And that was about 10 years ago when my first book, The Nature of Business, came out. And yes, over that time, over the last 10 to 15 years, I've been really actively engaging in this space around learning from living systems. How do we reconnect business and nature? My thinking and my way of communicating has, I would like to think, evolved. And certainly in that journey, I've learned a hell of a lot. But the deep underlying felt sense is the same as when I was seven years old. I thank you so much for that, because it's something that can be tickled out a little bit from your books, but it's so vital and it's going to set up nicely what we're going to talk about on how your experiences and the dealings with the businesses and the people you coach and, and the individuals, how there are similar transformations <clears throat> that occur when you try to apply regenerative models or regenerative practices into business as usual or normal corporations and how there is an evolution or a transformation, a shift that needs to occur one way or the other in those individuals as well. I have to confess, I for since I've read Jeremy Lent's book, The Web of Meaning, I've been going around basically telling everybody it's the best book I've ever read. When I read, and this is by happenstance, so I want to give a little bit of the backstory as well. I first read Regenerative Leadership because of Laura Storm and what I heard and saw from her and other groups from John Elkington to Daniel Christian Wall, where I read this book. And then I became so intrigued about your contributions and who you were that I immediately went out and got Future Fit. And then I read that and then I was already like, oh, I like this guy. This is singing my song. This is the information that I love. And then I reached out to you and I asked you if you would do a podcast. And in that you, you suggested I read your latest book, Leading by Nature, and also some of your other books. And I ended up reading them all. I actually went back and read this twice and I absolutely love it. It is fabulous. And it's, I believe, I have to say, it's the key I've been looking for, not only in my own work, but in, in a tool that a lot of businesses, organizations, and individuals need to even fathom or make an understanding of where the future of their organization will need to go to keep up with our exponentially growing world with the way that the world works at all, instead of 
this continual battle of capitalism or a really extractive type of economies or models out there that have a limit to growth, have a burnout rate, have an end to the future of work, so to say. And the tool, the, the question that I really not only make that statement that is such a fabulous book, but in, in your past dealings with all the organizations you've taught, all the individuals, when you're talking to them or trying to convince them that there's another model that works similar to the way nature and life works inherently, is that for most of these organizations an esoteric thing? Is this kind of like a weird, like you're talking about consciousness, you're talking about regeneration, are you some kind of a hippie tree hugger? What does that have to do with business? I want to hear about some of those struggles or some of those stories from you on what that feels like. And if those are things that you run into, they're saying, we're concerned about the bottom line. Why are you telling me I need to take a step back and realize how the world works? I'd love to hear some of those stories. Yes. And this is really the real challenge is helping to provide a bridge from one world to another and back to that watching that film or that video when I was 15 years old what was interesting two very interesting things came out of that experience for me one was it led me down a rabbit hole of understanding what civilization was really about but the other was that everyone was in that classroom was shocked, was hurt. You could see it in their eyes. It was sort of something deeply wrong. By two lessons after, so two and a half hours after, most people had moved on, even though it was obviously deeply shocking and worrying. Most people had moved on. By the weekend, me and two other people were still on it. Everybody else had moved on. By the following Monday, it was me. Now, that isn't to say that in any way I had something that the others didn't. It was more to recognise how easy it is for us to get caught up in a way of engaging with life. We are malleable. We are plastic. We are open. We are conscious emotional, cognitive, spiritual beings. And much of the time, we are woefully unaware of our potency and impact and our ability to be programmed. So that was a really interesting insight for me very early on, because I could see, whoa, hang on, we're up against things here. This isn't a case of just producing some videos. This isn't a case of communicating a message. This is a case of trying to unlearn mass programming and then try and relearn something. On that journey, what I found is two very powerful things that we have on our side, Mark. One is that we are all, and I noticed this in business in some of the darkest corners I've been in, that we are actually, we wish to be loved and to love each of us, no matter how psychopathic we've developed ourselves. And often the psychopathic tendencies I've met in narcissistic leaders as a result of them earlier on in their life being very sensitive and having to close down because of a lack of love in some way. So that's important to recognize that there is this capacity, there is this open door in all of us. And the second is that actually this unlearning and relearning is in itself a bit of an illusion because it's always here, always has been and always will be. So we're not actually inviting in a whole host of new things for us to equip ourselves with we're just opening our eyes to what we already said. And I just wanted to say that because there is some good here, a lot of good. That said, the reality of building a bridge 
from our current mindset into something that is more along the lines of what we're exploring here, your dead right is fraught with this is hippie, this is nothing to do with business, we haven't got time for this, or there's always some challenge. Either we're growing and we're doing well, so we haven't got time, or we're declining, so we have to cut costs, so we haven't got time. So one has to go right in, right in through the cracks into, and this is why I coach leaders one-to-one actually a lot, even though there's a lot of good in the peer group learning and journeys that people engage with, to really engage with the key leaders in an organization and to allow them to go through their own threshold crossings, their own shifts in meaning making. So they feel it, they sense it, they know it, that you're activating, you're reactivating a remembering in them. Now, whether that be going back to their childhood or whether it be ancestral connections or whether it be something that they know and it's something to that is emerging in them anyway. So a lot of these leaders are going through midlife crises in some way or shifts in meaning making and another bit of good news is that the current situation with the levels of stress and challenge and mental health and breakdown is actually helping stimulate that shift that threshold crossing but yes the short answer is yeah day-to-day challenges of having to engage with why is this, why am I needing to do this? And so one has to be a little bit streetwise, just like I was with developing the business case for sustainability back in corporate days, is you have to play the game a bit. You have to meet people where they're at and go, actually, hang on a minute. This is about future fitness. This is about helping your culture become more agile. And this is about unlocking the potential of your people. So you're high-performing talent want to stay here. This is about uh, enhancing your brand. This is about ensuring your value propositions actually are engaging people rather than just transactional, all of which the business mind starts to get. And the likes of McKinsey and some of the big strategy players are singing that tune. And so there is a message out there, which is actually, hang on a minute, we need to do business differently. So one has to... uh, ensure that message fits with that. The challenge comes if the message just stays at that level. Then you're meeting people where they're at and adding a bit on. You're not actually taking them on a journey of a threshold crossing, which is what is essential. That's amazing. So you unlocked a few things. One, you said it's pretty much the way it's always been there, I believe was the terminology you used. And I want to unpack that a little bit more and go deeper. So it's always been there for me says it's the way the world has always worked. And so if we align with that model, the way the world's always worked and that nature, and then our business is not only going to be future fit, but it's going to be in alignment with the way the world works already. And we're not going to have these siloed or mechanistic type of approaches, lean, scrum, agile, black belt, uh, jiu-jitsu, whatever they want to call it, is, is a form of a fight, a battle, or a way to mechanize nature in the natural world. And we're living beings, whether we're an organization or an employee, within that natural world that is trying to, and I hate to say, in many respects, just capitalize to to survive for the future. But I I believe there's a core model that you've talked about in all your books, especially this last book, that it's not only always been here, but it's a model that is symbiotic. It's always been the way the world has worked. You also tickle, in a couple of your books, you tickle in this neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism, natural selection, survival of the fittest, that somehow we thought was the way that the world worked to competing and natural selection and survival of the fittest, that that's the way the world worked, but that's not how the world has ever worked. It's in symbiosis, cooperation, collaboration, not only biomimicry, which you also touch upon, 
but on adopting and being part of the natural world or part of this world that is the way the world's always worked. And it works much better when you do that model. Am I correct in kind of what I'm saying, understanding in that as well? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can dive into detail here. Because the good news is, or the, the interesting thing is, is uh, what I talk about in Leading by Nature is this shift from achiever mindset into regenerative. Now, it's easy for our minds to be binary. This is the challenge. So we like to think, oh, okay, we're shifting from one into another. In reality, we're shifting from achiever into achiever and regenerative. Yeah, we don't lose the achiever. We need the achiever. But the achiever becomes a tool that serves the deeper purpose. Yeah. So we have these tensions inside in, in life. So life is full of tensions. It arises as far as we can understand out of this field of stillness and then goes into movement. And as it goes into movement, the yin yang symbol represents it very powerfully we quite quickly go into tensions of energy, which could be seen as polarities, but they're actually continua. Yeah, part of the same thing. They're just stretches like strings, if you like to, masculine, feminine, and so forth, light and dark, and passive and active. And that's how life works. I talk about divergence and convergence, and it's that tension of both of those that creates emergence, the way in which nature flows. And the same happens inside ourselves. It happens in our living organizations, and we need it for our teams, for the organization to adapt and evolve. But the same is going on in us. So we have just inside the brain, a number of little healthy tensions going on. We have the dorsal and the ventral ways of attending. So the dorsal is much more kind of focused and goal orientated, which is quite exciting. And we have an objective and we get going and that gives us a heightened sense of getting things done. But when it's constantly on all the time, it becomes grasping. It becomes, oh, my God, and we get that feeling of insecurity. I'm not doing enough. And oh, and that leads to burnout or actually a less good quality delivery of purpose. And so we need the ventral, which is more expansive, more awakening, more deeper sense of purpose. We also have the left and right brain hemispheres, quite big regions of the brain, which again have these quite different healthy tensions of perceiving life. The left brain hemisphere is very mechanistic, drilling down into the parts, abstracting things out of their lived in context. Yeah? And we need to do that as human beings. We need to be able to deal with this relational world of ours. But when we get too caught up in that, again, it comes with a heightened sense of, oh, yeah, we know about something and we can make it clear. and Everything becomes a project management Gantt chart or we run our businesses through an Excel spreadsheet or a profit and loss account. And whoa. And that's where the business case for sustainability, valuing whales, for instance, or dolphins because of their carbon capture and storage capacity, and things like that get too caught up. They come from a good place, perhaps, but it gets too mechanistic. It needs to be balanced with the right brain hemisphere, which sees more of the interconnections. And then we also have just in the head again, you have the top forehead insular region, which again is this sort of sense of driving forward. And then the back of the head the what they call the parental region, which is much more open to the awakened mind, to intuition. So just going on here, there are these healthy tensions that you can imagine, let alone when we go into the body with the sympathetic, parasympathetic, cortisol and adrenaline versus oxytocin, serotonin, all of these. So you get these healthy. And so we are part of this divergence, convergence, little creative dance that is sitting within the lovely creative alchemic dance of life, this choreography of dance. So we're immersed within it. It's going on within our own cells. It's going on with our genes. It's going on with us. And so understanding that helps us recognize when we get too caught up or out of kilter, too caught ensnared on one way of being. Now, what the yin yang symbol does very powerfully for us, and this is where ancient wisdom traditions are great, and they all align, quite frankly, even whether they come from the East or the, the West, or when you look deep into them, they all align around this fact, which is that when we deeply connect into source, then it's the yin that is the basis, and that yang rises out of it. Yeah, so what Lao Tzu means in his early work, know them, the masculine, yet keep in the feminine. Yeah. So it's, you, you, one needs to be 
applying that dorsal, that left brain hemisphere, that mechanistic, that narrowing down, but always then remaining in connected to the field, to life. And what we're doing and what we have done is get caught up in a journey of separation where we've got out of kilter and we've got more caught up in the left brain hemisphere, in the head, in the outer yang doing, in that dorsal activity, which is getting us more and more intense. People walking around on their emails, Zoom calls, not really looking where they are on the street, mental health going out the window, depression, people struggling, rampant debt and inequality. All of this is actually coming from this out of kilter way of attending to reality. And unless we can rebalance that attentiveness, then our ability to become a regenerative culture or to become a more sustainable organizational society is warped at best. I absolutely love that. And thank you for surmising it and describing it so visually how we work. We tend to see this quite a bit in the apps of a business, not only being mechanistic and having that separation that we separate ourselves from the way the world works, but in your books, what I also really love is you, this isn't hocus pocus magic. This isn't uh, esoteric in that respect. You talk about Dr. Fritz Hof Capra. You talk about system science, chaos theory. You talk about the yin and the yang. So Taoism and some other forms of thought. You talk about hard science that is proven this is a model of the way the world works. And so it's not some kind of a, a chant or mantra or religious almost in that respect uh, of what you're saying. There's a lot of science and data, which a lot of organizations want. They're always saying, give me my return on investment. Why is it better to be regenerative or to be more sustainable? What, what do, is it going to cost more? Is it going to, what's the benefit? And there's always that in the beginning but it's proving, especially during this pandemic time and this hard time that a lot of these leaders that you're mentioning are realizing that the models or the structure of their organization is just not working anymore. It's not future fit like your book talks about. It's not prepared for the future. And it's almost that unbalance with the way that the world's working. And so the organization doesn't keep up to speed with the future that we're moving towards. Love that, that where you interject that and where the sources come from, where that science comes from, and those ancient or wisdom or old philosophies or thought processes and science comes from. You talk about Lynn Margulis and the symbiosis and many other things. And I, as well, for almost 28 years now, I've been talking about some of those same things. And for many of those years, it was really interesting because people, they looked at me like I was esoteric, a hippie, a tree hugger. They'll say, Mark, what does a symbiotic earth or getting to the symbiocene mean? Or what's a regenerative business model? Or what's systems science or systems thinking? They thought I was speaking another language. How does that affect the bottom line? How do I do that? Uh, how do I please my board on that? And now during this craziness, we're, I'm seeing, and I hope hopefully you are as well, seeing more people saying talking. I was at at Davos in May of this year, they're talking about regeneration. They're talking about regenerative business models. And I'm not sure they know what that means. It's a buzzword or trendy right now, but it, I'm like, wow, that's unbelievable. And so now the tools are in your book, Leading by Nature, and all your other books as well, on where to look, how to make that organization. And it's almost and I know this isn't the right terminology, and so that's why I want to say it so that maybe you could phrase it in the right way. It's a way to calculate that return on investment by aligning yourself and your organization with regenerative models, with regenerative thinking, with a symbiosis in the way the world works, some of these shifts in consciousness in this transition 
before you even start to say, not only am I aligning myself and I'm going to have tons of benefits as an individual or a leader in this organization, but my entire organization is going to be future fit and the benefits are really going to be there. And we've seen that in those organizations that have made that shift. Are you seeing that as well? How is it? I don't imagine you're not selling what you teach or what you coach to anyone. I'm sure people are hitting a point where they're ready. They're realizing that some of these models and systems don't work. And then they're coming to you. How do you take them on that last journey, that last little transition to understanding? It's, that's why I, I, sometimes the one-to-one -one work is important because when people, when a, any person, a, a, a human really starts to get it, and that takes some time because you're inviting someone, someone needs to be ready to your point of, I'm not selling myself. People come, things, I assume that when someone contacts me, that it's because something's going on. And when we usually then start working together, if it feels right, if the connection's right, then quite quickly one recognizes oh okay i get now why they're here and what's going on because i've had people come here sometimes and say or if it's on online saying oh, i need help with organization becoming more efficient effectiveness or future fit and i'm like that's not what i do but and then when you get past that initial bit you go oh, okay some of that is a defense mechanism the person knows that they're after something else but they don't know how to verbalize that they don't and they and because i've come from is I have not only trained in leadership development with my own diplomas and masters and so forth, but I've actually been a leader in corporate, in the cutting edge bit of high stress corporate life and ran many large P&Ls and so forth and programs of change. I can empathize with where the person is coming from. And therefore I feel they are able to trust me to a certain extent, that I'm not a seen as something, someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. So to start off with in those early dance moves, if you like, what it is about, okay, well, what is this? How? How is this going to help me with my e-commerce platform? How is this going to... And you need to be able to talk about that. If you can't and you're just on an island right out there um, in the deep woods, then it's difficult for people to reach and connect. But quite quickly... And I had a, so as an example, I had a, a CEO from a, a Dutch organization here just two days ago, and we had three hours together. And at the end of it, I said, well, how do you feel? This was his first session. I said, how do you feel? And he said, well, I didn't realize we were going to move so quickly. And you've got to move quite quickly in those early stages. One, to see whether that person's ready for this. And two, so they get it. So they, whoa, oh, okay, this isn't just coaching. This isn't them saying some stuff and me asking some questions to invite in a deeper exploration. That's obviously important, but it's more. It's okay, let's really explore. Where is your business? Where is your organization? Where are you at in your life? And you have to do quite a lot in those first couple of sessions for them to go, great, okay, gosh, whoa. And then you can work. And then that work is actually holding space for that person, that psyche, to open for them to feel safe enough to open, to actually dare to explore some of this stuff, which to them could feel a bit like, well, what is that? And how does it relate to the business? So you're just giving them, you're holding a space for them to go, it's okay to explore that. It is good for your business. It is gonna help your business. This, it is gonna help you. You may be unpicking the very things that you feel have enabled you to be successful to get to this step in your life. But don't worry, that's okay. So that's quite important for them to get to a stage of trusting, not just me, but trusting th this process of opening to life. And that it's not going to end up becoming a mess with them just being on the floor and not able to hold down a job, that actually it's going to make them a better leader and it's going to help their organization become richer. I love that. And what I realize is, so I, I said at the beginning of our podcast, this is sponsored by the Aloha's Regenerative Foundation. And when I finished this the first time, <clears throat> I immediately said, I want everybody, core founding member of the foundation to go through this book, to read it, or to actually get some kind of a, a training for, from you. I've spoken about it in in 
similar ways, but at different times and different sorts of presentations, a lot of the same things that you've discussed in your book or that you hone in on in the book. And what I've heard over the years is a lot of people are so stuck in the, in the rut of business as usual or in how their mechanistic jobs work or their me mechanistic views of organizations tell me what to do. This is my job description and not being part of an organization or not being part of this ch change to be future fit. And that it's uh, like Frederick Laloux's book, Reinventing Organizations and Teal Organizations and just talking about this is your family. You spend the majority of your time with these people. Why not enjoy it and be the best you can? And also not just get monetary benefit out of it, but get a whole plethora of other benefits out of changing the way you look. And I see that a lot of people, even at the UN, at the World Economic Forum level, in my own foundation, tend to be numb or desensitized in some respects about some of these new concepts, that it's not about change or agile or KPIs. You also discuss that type of t talking, which are really all past performance indicators and have very little to do with the future or even reaching the future. And it's basically repeating old models and old mistakes, so to say, that they don't get it because they're just numb or desensitized. But because of the pandemic, because of the war in Euro Ukraine, because of the new president in Brazil, because of Brexit or whatever crisis that's going on in the world, they're starting to say, boy, these systems are not lo no longer, or these business models are no longer working for me. What's a new model? What could be better and looking? And so I, the question is, I know you have your farm and this acreage where you bring people. And I don't know if that's how this last leader from Denmark went through the session with you, but it, is it also a big part of the environment that you're reconnecting them to nature by doing some of this work outside? Or is that not always necessary in, in, in this journey? And, and is it part of setting up that other environment that we, that the when I say zombie or numb or desensitized people, that they've separated the natural world. And so they're in a sterile business environment. They're surrounded by computers and phones and technology. Is there, as part of the process as well that you, let's go on a walk, let's go out in the trees. Is uh, And what part of that function also do you use? And hopefully you understand what I'm trying to ask and say to you there. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Thank you, Mark. You're yeah, teasing out some really good stuff here. I think there's something, to, just to start with, there's something around the inner and the outer here that feels important to share. So our inner psyche, um, our deeper nature, um, with all the shadow projections and stuff that we've stuffed in about what people think of us and so forth, and our own dharma, our own true essence. And then the outer nature of us, how are we showing up? And again, that's affected by our inner nature, but also conditioned programmings and so forth, and, and our own energy levels and so on. Then there's the inner nature of the organization, the, the way in which people are showing up every day, as you just said, why not make it make it a place where people really unlock their brilliance? Surely that, that makes good sense. And then the outer nature of the organization, which is these value propositions, the stakeholder relationships. How are we actually engaging with everyone? Are we looking, are we treating someone over there, just managing the margin? Whereas over here, giving some money to a charity because it's good for the brand. What's the integrity of how we're showing up as well? And that, that, that journey is important for both the organization as a living system and for the individual leaders. And everyone in the organization, by the way, is a form of, of leader in some way. So when I engage with someone to your question there, what, how key here is allowing that shift. And there are shifts in meaning making that we have in our lives and can, quite profound ones. Some studies say it's every seven or 11 years around that sort of rhythm, but certainly there are some quite meaningful threshold crossings around late adolescence into early, early adulthood and around a, what has been called a midlife crisis, which can be from any age, by the way. I've coached people through that at the age of in their 60s or in their late 30s. It's not about age, it's more about how are you engaging with that and how are you processing that? 
but those moments are where the inner and the outer are starting to try and engage. And they're quite important, very important, because they're opportunities to allow something deeper to come through. And the same for the organization, actually. The organization as a living system has these patterns that we can superimpose onto human life if we wish in terms of age, which is sometimes helpful. But it de definitely they go for these upstretch moments, like a startup does well and becomes a B Corp, becomes purposeful, but then gets to around 150 or so people. And some of the more corporate people come in and they want to find revenue. They want to take it to 500 mil and quite frankly, why not? Because it increases its impact and so forth. But in the process, it changes. And then it hopefully gets to a point where it kind of starts to go, well, okay, it may be too much of that. How do I re-engage? So for the leader, this inner outer relationship, this threshold crossing, this metamorphic unfolding, um, yes, nature is a powerful medium for that. There's no doubt about it, because of course, that's helping us with the inner outer. However, a lot of the people I coach are online. And thanks to COVID, actually before COVID, I wasn't that keen on, on that. And, and therefore, I was probably limiting my, my, my reach. But actually, people reached out during COVID. And I have proven time and again that one can take leaders through powerful journeys completely online. Now, I give people homework in between those sessions. So actually, the online sessions are just their check-in processes themselves. But actually, the work happens between the sessions. And yes, I usually give homework to people where they find spots in nature where they can start connecting and doing it. I was with a, someone the other day just from a, a, an organization in, in, in France, and we were working with how they can actually do a practice that they've developed in nature more often. Because that's helping them connect in an energetic way, with a sense of place, with a sense of other, with a sense of, and how shall I put this, that we're not experiencing reality. Reality is experiencing itself through us. And that's quite a significant shift from, I'm this sort of separate being in the world with my little piece to offer, into actually I'm a self that is participating, co-creating, co-evolving within the world. Symbiosis is part of that. That is a shift. Now, it's all well and good having words around that. Actually, you need to have an embodied experience of that. So allowing the leader to have mini peak experiences or shifting that actually these peak experiences don't have to happen when I'm on holiday halfway up a mountain. They can happen in the day. In fact, we can open ourselves to more of that. More information, more wisdom comes in. It helps us with that shift. And so that's important. So yes, nature is a powerful tool for that, but it doesn't have to be. Going deep inside our own sense of self through meditation, for instance, in a basement, in a factory, can also allow a deep sense of connection to inner nature. I recently saw you on, I don't know if it was the Volans Book Club or on Volans, a little kind of video interview podcast about the book. Volans is fabulous because of Green Swans, John Elkington, the triple bottom line. I don't know if, or I'm sure you do, that John Elkington 2018 recalled the triple bottom line, people planning a profit, mainly because of his work with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, he was seeing people were using that as a accounting principle, mainly focusing in on the profits and forgetting about people and planet. And so he recalled it, but then what a lot of people didn't realize is the recall came back out with, with responsibility, resilience, and regeneration. <clears throat> in his book, Green Swans, he says on the subtitle of Green Swans, it's regenerative capitalism. And so my question is, I love John. I love Lou, Lou Keller up. She's wonderful. But is that even possible? Regenerative capitalism? I question that. And I'd like to get your take on is regenerative capitalism something possible or is that an oxymoron? We're back to our bridges again. Well, if I cut straight to the chase, the one scares off the horses. Yeah, evolving capitalism is healthy, no doubt about it. And so regenerative capitalism 
is an evolution of capitalism, which is healthy. Go some capitalism. If we go on a deep dive, and which I have done in the illusion of separation, which was hugely useful for me and my own understanding of things, does find its roots in mechanistic materialism. Now, what does that really mean? That actually, it's overly focused on that left-brained hemisphere approach, compartmentalizing things into capitals that can be measured and can be controlled and owned and revenue streams generating from them. Now, back to our point that we said earlier on, we're shifting from achiever to regenerative. In reality, we're actually shifting from achiever to regenerative and achiever. Yeah, I achiever is a kind of tool that helps serve the underlying regenerative capacity, i.e. we're not getting rid of the dorsal, we're not getting rid of the left brain hemisphere and so forth. No, we need them. They're part of what makes us human. They're special. The ego isn't something to be dissolved. It's a useful tool that serves our capacity to deal in this relational world. And let's pause it for a moment, Mark, because otherwise we could get ourselves into a much deeper philosophical conversation. But let's pause it for a moment that actually capitalism is a useful tool that serves. It has been useful. It has delivered in many ways on many of its KPIs, even if those KPIs are too mechanistic, that the wider picture has crumbled as a result of those <laughs> delivery. And so therefore that tool, just like we talked about the achiever mindset, can sit within something deeper. And there's no reason why that tool that socioeconomic narrow view on things that breaks things down into parts and that man manages and measures and so forth could not also be a useful part of our future. So I'm not here to throw mud at capitalism. I feel we've gone on a journey for many reasons, and that journey has been immensely useful for our civilization. And our civilization is getting to a point now of a, quite a potential upstretch, a momentous moment for our human way of being in the world and so let's build on what we've learned from the past and that's not about capitalism versus communism or individualism versus collectivism quite frankly or even left versus right in politics that's old news we need to transcend that and work with the aspects and start to set it within the way in which life on earth works, that's not new. Cultures have been doing that for millennia. The vast portion of our human history, we have that in our muscle memory. And yet we need to build a bridge so that we don't see it as something too big. We see it as something that we can place stepping stones on. And if regenerative capitalism is one of those stepping stones, then I am supportive of it. And you touched upon this just now, the way the world works. Do you believe there's a set model? Is it re a regenerative model, the way the world works? And can you be so bold to define that very specifically f for us? Let's take the concept of reality. So rather than us thinking we are perceiving reality, and therefore on our process of evolution, we're seeing more and more of how the world works, and we're just getting deeper and closer to the truth. It's one way of seeing it. Another way is recognizing that actually reality is perceiving itself through us, that we are in a dance, that we are in this universe or multiverse song, as it were, that is informed by something beyond which our minds can comprehend, that our minds or our brains, at least of the brain, the heart, the gut, three powerful neurological centers, are tuning in to something that they're not actually producing. They are, of course, co-creating and have self-agency, but they're actually more like antennas or transducers than they are else. And so that, that shifts things. And so we often think about how the world works and our minds naturally go to outer, to fixing, to let's get some principles about how to design products and services and so forth. And we need that. We need that. So that gives us some stepping stones again. That gives us some solidity in the ocean. However, if we get too caught on the solidity and forget the immensity of the ocean, then we're just creating another little, little illusion for ourselves. And so how does the world work? Good news is that's beyond our capacity. What we can do 
is tune in and learn to cultivate the capacity that we have as homo sapiens, living up to our name as wise beings, and to actually start to activate natural capacities that we've always had. For indigenous, there was this film called Luna, which looks at the Kogi in the Sierra Nevada. And so this culture has really tried to keep on to its old indigenous roots throughout a horrid uh, attack from the mechanistic mind over the years. And they are saying now is the time for, for us to share more of this wisdom. And a BBC reporter went over there and produced a film some years ago and then did an upgrade of it to Luna more recently. And in the documentary, there was a moment where, and it was so revealing, where they brought the Kogi, Kogi came over here, chewing their tobacco and their robes and everything, to some scientific labs in Cambridge to talk about astrophysics. And you could see these top-notch scientists, some of the best brains in that mechanistic, materialistic worldview, explaining very proudly what we have found through these multi-billion lights and the space stations that we've put up there. On the edges of the universe, we were discovering these, and these things or out in our solar system and galaxy, these nebulae. And, and we have been showing this picture. And one of the guys chewing this sort of tobacco and there with his long hair and so forth said something and that have translated it, which is, oh, this pointing at something on the map going, oh, we call it such and such. And you could see the scientist that mind that his blood just drained from his face and you could see something had happened he had listened to this and the so the bbc reporter or the who used to be bbc reporter said oh, what was what, what's happened what why what why did what he just say create a response and the scientist said it's unbelievable because he's talking about a star that we've only just discovered how would he know about it we've just discovered it and that shows a worldview collided yeah so you've got a very important mechanistic, materialistic perspective, which has brought huge strides in medicine, transportation, digitization. <clears throat> you and I are enjoying now, nothing wrong with it. And that is showing us these nebulae and how red dwarfs work and all of these sorts of things and how it's discovered this new constellation and how important that is. Unable to understand that some people deeply connected, to use the expression, into the way the world works, or deeply immersed into something beyond the rational mind, is already able to have seen that and understand that and feel. That is a chasm in our way of knowing. And so the journey that we're taking is a powerful one because we're actually allowing ourselves to still hold on to the ability to develop space stations and 5G and agile teams and all of that good stuff that we need for today's world, whilst opening up to this world that is beyond how we think it works, but we are able to sense into it. We are able to open into how life really is. And just to say that it's not about us asserting ourselves it's not about us fixing the world <laughs> it's about us as you said earlier learning to get back in tune so that we can feel the heartbeat of the universe again does that become difficult when you're speaking with these very data-driven, show-me-the-numbers type of business people that say, okay, I need to see the results of that, even though everything you talk about in your book is science-based, it's very solid, that is how our world is working, and that's the direction for a better model, when they're when you when they're saying oh being more sustainable or being more regenerative or adding that on my organization is that where's the data showing me that's a better model what what do have you dealt with that have you run into that at all and what do you usually tell them and is that somebody who's not ready yet to be picked up and you say okay how, how do you deal with that yeah, I run into it all the time uh, and I've learned to enjoy it rather than get triggered by it because it's okay. It, it's back to this meeting people where they're at. Use spiral dynamics or some of the models that I've pulled together in, in Leading by Nature. You have this sort of orange-green teal 
shift from mechanistic into regenerative, the achiever into regenerative. And the orange and the green levels that we have predominantly in organizations today. So the orange being the sort of organization's machine, measuring, monitoring, controlling, reducing, having a handle on cost levers. We need that. It helps the business survive in a challenging time. So it's not getting rid of that. It's That's a basis, but it's not just getting limited by that. And then you've got that green, which is more about sustainable business, understanding stakeholder value, well-being in the workplace, diversity and inclusion, all of that good stuff, which is really starting to become stronger in the world at the moment. But then teal living systems is a quite a significant shift on from those. And so you're picking up in that language you were just sharing there, you're picking up a leader talking about some stuff from orange, some maybe stuff from green. And so you've got to meet people where they're at. There are tools out there that report people's awareness or happiness in the workplace or well-being or innovation that can be helpful. However, what's really important here is, again, to have some key leaders in the organization to get it. And Frederick Lelou talks about this. If you, and he, he's very specific. He says, if you don't have the CEO on board, forget it. Now, I would say that you could you can work in some big organizations that I'm working with where as long as you have some key people in there, you can still do some really good stuff. But if those key people don't get it, then you are going to get caught up in when, especially in times of challenge now, when naturally the cost levers come in. So I'll give you a prime example. And this is why we need to engage both the felt sense or the emotional or even though i say it's a spiritual aspect of the human being as well as the mechanistic we need to appeal to both otherwise we're going to get too caught up on the business model and not get both so an example is a client consumer goods company needing to ramp down costs going into the recession very obvious the see doing some filming here in the woods with some of the individuals that, from the company and it was actually some of the let's say less senior people in the organization sitting around the fire with the camera on them sharing whilst the CEO was chatting to me, he started just listening because you could see the hairs on the back of the neck of the CEO when he was listening to a couple of the people sharing around the fire what this journey of becoming more regenerative had truly meant to them. When one guy from relatively junior to say early on in his career was saying to camera early on when we were starting to deal with this regenerative stuff, I thought it was a load of bollocks. I used to roll my eyes and think, what is this? This is just going to be another fad that we're going to go through. And it's taken me a while. It's, uh, I've been now here at the organization for 12 months. And honestly, I have felt in my, not just in my working life, how it's enabled me to take more responsibility and accountability and work in a more effective way. But in my personal life, I've gone through a change. And my family, my friends have all noticed this and shared that back to me. And I I know that it's because of this regenerative journey. And you could see when the CEO heard that, the hairs on the back of his neck changed. And then another person straight after, again, quite a different person from an ethnic background, very challenged upbringing, again, saying a very a similar story, but in a different way, which was just struggled with a lot of this. Dollar. But then after a while, it really started getting into me. And I was talking about quite a profound experience he had had in his personal life and if it hadn't have been for this, the tools that we'd been exploring, he would have gone back under again in his social life. And how as a result of this, it's given him the resilience to carry through. Now, moments like that, which were, I have to say, unplanned, it just happened. And so it could have not happened. And me, we could have been just talking about the business case without those factors. But when those factors come in, it's clear for the leader to see, OK, this isn't just about enhancing the brand. This isn't just about improving more efficiency and effectiveness in the business. This isn't just about helping people work more effectively. Yes, it needs to be about those things and you can make a good coherent case around them. But it's also, this is simply the right thing to do. Why am I not doing it? And you need a leader, and that's why one takes them on a journey, that is open to that. If they're too caught up in the old system, they're not going to allow themselves to even see that. And then the business and civilization isn't going to move on. So you need to give people the space for them to be able to go, hang on, why am I not doing this? I often ask a lot of my guests and people I speak with, what are all the models that they're living in a typical daily 
life, say a Monday, which would be typically a working day, I'd say, what are all the models that you're living? What different type of economic models are you living? What kind of organizational models are you living? Is it extractive, is it hedonistic? And what we find out is there's usually at least three different models in individuals living in one typical day. One's a model that they live at work and another one's a model they live at home. And then there's a separate model of what they would like to do or what their hobbies or passions are that usually comes in there as well. And first of all, it's a hard, it's a hard type of exercise to do with most people because you just see smoke coming out of the ears. They're like, what in the heck? And it, even if you just ask them the simple question, what economic model are you living? They're like, most people don't have a clue. But it, when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, it's a lot of those models that many of us are living in our daily lives are pulling in separate directions and which is creating an extreme amount of havoc on, on our health, our mental health, our physical health, because we're, it's almost like living two lives. So this, you're preparing to go to work to live this other model. And then when you come home, you're, you've got to shut that off somehow to live a different thing. And they're going in separate directions, but one's helping to provide for the other. And it's this craziness. And so I totally, uh, you know, that when, when you spoke earlier and what, what you were saying is it comes out that when those two align, like reinventing organizations and this work-life balance, we hear about that quite a bit, or this yin and the yang and, and the story that you just told, what a world of difference that makes not only in your enjoyment and the colleagues you work with in your work life, but in your family life, your personal life, your how much less you prepare to go to work or how much less stress you have to be there. But it's a, like a family. It's a whole different ball set, a mindset and way of being. And that brings me back to something that you said much earlier in our conversation. You says we need to kind of be aware of the masculine but hold in the feminine. I think I'm trying to repeat what you said. And the reason I bring that up is throughout all our civilization frameworks we've ever had in our world so far, well over 21 different civilization frameworks, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayans, Greeks, Romans, on and on. All of those civilizations big, knowledgeable, innovative infrastructure civilization frameworks all collapsed and all but three collapsed because of <laughs> env environmental or ecological collapse, which is basically basic needs, food, agriculture, water, infrastructure, basic needs. And those three that collapsed because, uh, not because of ecological or environmental collapse, because of disease, displacement, or just some form of disruption. But all of the civilization frameworks that don't exist anymore, that, that are all ruins that we take selfies on vacation on, all collapse because they were running the same model. And that model was a very hierarchy model with a man, a leader, president, emperor, priest on the top, and on the bottom were slaves, peasants, farmers, laborers on the bottom holding that model up. And that model is absolutely not regenerative. And it's one that we see continually being repeated today. And most of our organizations have that hierarchy model. Most of them don't have a lot of feminine leadership of that feminine in the big picture. I, I wanted to see what your thoughts or takes on that are. And if that's something that we don't see in regenerative models, we don't see that in the way the world really works, this hierarchy structure. And how do you, maybe you have some tips or wisdom, how do we break free from that instead of the repeating the Dines problem theory, the definition of insanity, keep creating new systems with the same thinking that we created the ones that aren't working with. Let's start with Einstein. There's a lot there, like all your yeah. questions. I could go in. Uh, many directions with them so thank you mark and that's fine 
the lovely canter through the civilizations there. And interestingly, how the quality of soil has always declined as well. And this relationship again with inner and outer, the soil within us, the psyche soil, and also the soil outside us, which we can touch on in a moment. But just to start with Einstein, just to get us going. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, he said. The rational mind, its faithful servant. We have created a society that honours the servant and has forgotten the gift. So this is the problem. So the intuitive mind, let's be honest, has been in our lives through the education that we've experienced, which I suspect is reasonably privileged compared to a lot of other human beings on the planet. The intuitive mind has been kind of way, yeah, 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 yeah. And so everything else has taken over and, and back to our imbalance again. So we've prioritized that. So we've done what these other civil, high civilizations have done. And that has created imbalance. And so it's really a case of integration. Your previous comment about people integrating their lives, I'd like to get beyond work-life balance and actually a sort of an integration process where we know how to find that balance and flow, even during the working day outside work. And I feel that is something that we each need to learn. How do we work with balance? How do we integrate? As just one of the values I talk about, the regenerative leadership virtues, balance and, and, and courage and patience and purposefulness that kind of work together. So working with that, that yin yang all the time, keeping ourselves grounded. When we go into the feminine, what we find is that stillness, is that place beyond all of the dorsal, left brain hemisphere, top frontal lobe and all that, we drop into something deeper. We are nourished. Reality coming through us, experiencing itself, rather than us experiencing reality. The inner and outer shifts. And these shamanic communities, indigenous communities, of which there are only fragments left, unfortunately, but have held on to a way of living, regardless of many of them all the way around the world having very similar principles that have held on to all of those civilizations coming and going. Many of them have said, I met an elder a while ago at a, a Bioneers conference, I think it was probably 15 years ago, I was talking to him, an indigenous elder, and he said, what we do is we sing and dance round the fire every day with our barefoot on the earth, beating and drumming, singing and dancing every evening. If we don't, we know that we get ill, we get sick, we get sick. Unfortunately, we've allowed ourselves to get diseased, to get out of balance, and that's creating all of these problems, as you say, in civilization. So uh, back to this reconnecting, the simplicity of this is that it's here. Dancing and singing, loosening ourselves up, allowing ourselves to integrate. Now on a deeper flow, going through a threshold, going through a midlife crisis, Actually, one also experiences perhaps sometimes depression or questioning or dissonance. So we need to go through that space. And that's where someone like a coach can help as a light in that to guide through that process. But let's also keep that freeing. Let's allow the dancing and the singing and the bare feet on the earth. Ensure that we don't get too serious with this process of integration and healing, because fundamentally, this is about love. This is about realizing that life, Gaia, is a living, sentient being that we are part of. And so it's about reconnecting back into that love. And so we need to keep ourselves open and per that, per permeating with that richness of life. So it's, I'd like to just bring in that concept of dancing and singing and that when we don't do that, we get to treat ourselves too seriously, whether it be getting ourselves caught up in the climate emergency or important factors, we actually take ourselves out of the very feeling of this aliveness, of this love of life. I'm a student of ecological economics. Herman Daly passed away, sadly, October 28th, just not too long ago. And I really have seen so many ecological economic models emerge in the last 10 to 20 years. Some of them you and I know very well, but a lot of people haven't ever heard of. Obviously, there's donut economics, circular economy, planetary boundaries, platform economics, shared mission economics, on and on. There is a form of regenerative economics as well. And 
the reason I bring this up, I just spent two and a half weeks at the climate conference of the co conference of the parties, COP27, Shalman Sheikh, Egypt. It's hard to have an optimistic perspective. I wish that every leader there, every delegate, every negotiator ha had gone through one of your courses or coaching sessions, had read your book because our world would be a much different place. There is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel because the Club of Rome just shortly before the COP came out with a new book. And I don't know if you've read it. It's called Earth for All. It's a Club of Rome report. It's a survival guide for humanity. But it talks about a new ecological economic model. And there's a lot about regenerative economies in there, that that thinking. And it's a really good it's a really good book, but I wanted the last kind of big question about your book and about what you do. I would like to get your take on not only is there another model for business and for life that you know, mimics our natural world and it's always been there, but there are some better, bigger models out there for ecological economics. It's interesting to know that there's a way to integrate regeneration into that really ingrained form of ecological economics that can take us to a whole different world. What's your thoughts or views on that? And do you touch on that a little bit more or your thoughts for future? My, my next book will be on that. So I've also written some books. My next book will be more of a PhD thesis on a different form of ecological economics. But I'd like your thoughts and feelings on how you're, we're seeing this emerging more and more because our capitalism models and our extractive models aren't working for us anymore. Where do you think we're going to end up at? Where do you think things are going to fall and lie? We're all going to be circular economy, donut economics, or what are your thoughts and feelings? I think there's a lot here. There's a lot around regenerative agriculture, regenerative medicine regenerative economics, regenerative design, regenerative business, all of these things are starting to come out into the zeitgeist and are amalgamating. Each of us in this space bring our own unique tunes and that's great, there's a diversity within that unity. The one thing I would add to this is, I remember your language there around sort of ecological economics. It reminds me of when psychology started really getting involved in this reconnection back into nature and it had environmental psychology and ecological psychology, which is sometimes called eco-psychology for short. And I think the difference between those two, environmental psychology was about recognizing that being in nature made us better, made us more creative, more compassionate, more alive, and therefore we should be doing that because it's a good thing for us as humans. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. It's important, but could be achiever and could be mechanistic because it's, it's an enhancement again, but there's nothing wrong with that. We need that. Ecological economic psychology or eco-psychology is about actually recognizing that we are fundamentally part of nature, that we are an aspect within it, that we are immersed within it, that our minds are not becoming as an epiphenomenon of the brain structure, that we are actually tuning into something. And that's why I talk about nature's wisdom. It's, I also talk about logic of life principles throughout my books. You will see applying business principles using biomimicry and regenerative thinking and so forth and applying it to business. We need that. But underpinning that is a substrata which is how life beyond the principles and practices, but beyond the economic structures, there is an underlying capacity to tune in. And if we miss that, then we're gonna come up with more new stuff, new definitions, as you've just repeated, there's five or six of them. That's good, because it's diversity, and there's a unity underneath them. And I suppose what I'm pointing to here, just to ensure that it's there, is that there is that deep sense of connection. So when I talk about nature's wisdom, yes, we have about change and so forth, but actually change is about going into the stillness within the movement. Yes, we have tensions and dealing with those tensions and relationality, but yet let's actually go into how through dialogue we can work through those tensions as crucibles for learning, for evolution. And then when I talk about interconnectedness and relationality, yes, of course, everything's related and we need right relation, but actually, how do we sense that interconnectedness and how does that shift how we perceive and how we engage as a living organization in an interconnected system? So I would invite in 
that step again, that ensuring that underneath that is a thread through eco ecological economics, there is a thread that encourages a mindset shift, which is an integration at a psychological level. Otherwise, it's very easy to do what we know is a, very, a great tendency of ours to get caught up in the models again and the fix it approach. And then we'll fill ourselves with more books, more reports, more color point charts and so forth, which are definitely an improvement on what went before. So that's good. I'm not, I think it's very helpful. But unless we weave in that reconnection back into the sacredness of life, then we are still lost. Absolutely. And uh, there's one thing that you uh, I need to tickle out that you just mentioned. In your book, you also talk about the quantum as well. And I think that there is, by adopting these models or by using them or being more connected to nature of these models that have always been there, and we just bridge that gap in realization that actually there's a form of the exponential function or the speed of success because life just flows better. It works better. We're not fighting things. We're not reaching that limit to growth. We're not, it's not GDP and extraction on a finite planet. It's more in harmony. It's more that yin and the yang and that, that, that quantum aspect of quantum leaps or mechanics of however you do it. I just automatically have seen it in my own businesses in life and what I've done that that it's just a better model that works more efficiently in, in our worlds. I don't know if you hear this as much as I do, but everybody's on their tongue the last um, 15 years, exponential this, exponential organizations, exponential everything. And they don't even understand the compound effect or the exponential function, but yet they use it in their thing. And then you look at their models and how they talk about KPIs and all these things you're saying, well, that has nothing to do with that. And I just see that in a much different way in regenerative organizations. I have three last questions for you. And this next one's probably the hardest one I'll ask you. It's really based upon, uh, I'm a big fan of Buckminster Fuller, Bucky and, and his kind of why, his mission that he released at the World Fair and at the peace game, that world peace game that he did. And it was basically the question to you is, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not for others, but what does a world that works for everyone look like to you? Interesting question there, Mark. You slipped in at the end. So <laughs> yes, I think that rhymes nicely with what we were talking about earlier, that it's very easy for the mind to go to fixing, to go to the outer. What does a world work? So, and um, so, yes, I think there is a lot that, that we could do to fix and sort the outer out. But in the spirit of this conversation, I will weave in the inner. What's coming to mind is actually the immensity of the sea. And where am I getting that phrase from is a, a, a lovely um, French writer called Antoine saint Duxbury, uh, who wrote The Little Prince and uh, other books. And he says, if you want to build a ship, don't assign people tasks or break them out into teams or get them to chop wood. Instead, teach them to long for the immensity of the sea. And I feel, yes, of course, now back to our achiever and also achiever and regenerative. Of course, we need to break people down into tasks and get them to chop wood. We need to build the ship. So it's, we're not saying we don't need these models and we don't need these solutions and we don't need to move towards regenerative. Of course we do. Yet, how much are we teaching people to long for the immensity of the sea? Let's open that door. And I feel that the party is just getting started and the big guests are arriving now on the scene, which is how life really works. And we are opening our minds to that. So a world that works for everyone is a recognition that the individual mind is a special contributing song line within a deeper song of songs, that we are immense, powerful, unique, diverse aspects within the unity of life, that there is diversity within unity, and that we aren't actually these creators of consciousness. We are allowing life to come through us, and that death 
is just another threshold in the process of life. And so rather than getting scared of death and being fearful of survival, we can open that door out of the fear and start to reconnect back into the rapture of reality. So a world that works for everyone is one where we begin to dance again, barefooted and sing and feel that life again inside our souls. That is one of the best answers I've had to that question ever. I've asked everyone who's come on the podcast that same question. And I have to tell you, almost everybody's answer has been different. Very few have been similar. And I also have to align myself with you that I long for the immensity of regenerative, desirable futures. And it's almost just like the question that I asked you it comes from Buckminster Fuller, but it's his why, his purpose for existing, his long envision. It's not the how, chopping the wood or building the boat to, to see the immensity of the seas. It's the wire vision to make it desirable. Why? So I, I'm a sustainable development goal advocate. I do a lot with resilience. And But why do people want to be sustainable? Why do they, is it going to be boring? Is it a better future? What's that future look like? And, and so by setting that why and that longing for that immensity of the sea and longing for a regenerative desirable futures that works for everyone boy that right there we'll figure out the how we can do it but that that why is so beautiful and you put it so eloquently the last two questions i have for you is if there was one message that you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life even if it's two messages what would it be your message I'm not sure it's any easier than the last question there. Synchronicity. I'll go for that. There is more and more evidence, back to our earlier point about science, there's more and more evidence coming out now that as we notice synchronicities, as we notice the non-locality of reality, and we bring that into our experience of life, that we not only notice them more, but that it awakens different aspects of our mind and therefore helps us upgrade. And so I feel bringing in synchronicities, being open to them, noticing them, allowing them to show us pathways of insight is vital in these times. What have you experienced or learned in this long journey that you would have loved to know from a start? Gosh, I, life is the learning journey. So it's very easy to think of how one might speed up the journey and therefore try and fix the journey. But I, I get the question, what would I, when I explored the illusion of separation, I was just about to do a PhD at the time at a leading business school. They kindly invited me. They knew I was leaving corporate life and they kindly invited me to do a PhD on business inspired by nature. And in the process of it, I decided, no, it was the wrong thing for me to do because I could see how it was getting quite mechanistic. So I decided instead to write this book, The Illusion of Separation, just go on my own exploration as to this sense of interconnectedness of consciousness that I have. What is it? And in that process, I stumbled across the fact that <laughs> there were a whole shed load of brilliant minds throughout history that have been exploring this. And I came across people that are still alive today, like Irvin Laszlo, and got invited to speak at their special. So it was a really interesting journey for me. And I suppose it would have been nice if some of those ancient wisdom traditions, Hermeticism, alchemy, Taoism, Shintoism, um, shamanism, all of these ways of thinking, which are deep, and rich and really all have the same underlying message all have the same aspect to them that maybe they had made themselves known to me a bit earlier in life but i i say that with apprehension because i have a feeling that everything can buy everything is with hindsight happens at the right time in the way it's meant to. yes i think that would be my response maybe understanding and having space for some of these deeper learnings earlier on would have been 
Giles, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. Highly recommend Leading by Nature to anyone. I have no more questions for you unless you have anything you'd like to say or ask me. I'm done and I really appreciate all your valuable time. There's been some nuggets of wisdom and some really beautiful things that have come out in this conversation that are of value. And I know it's going to be a great podcast. People will love it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for your experience and your insight as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.